Thank you very much. Praise God. You can be seated. Man, I tell you, I am so excited about what God is doing here and seeing all of these people healed. Just wonderful. You know, I've uh, been believing for healing for a long time. That's one of the very first things that I started believing God for, and I've seen a lot of healings and a lot of great things. But my greatest joy now is to teach other people and see them reach out and receive it because that's the only way that we're going to make a difference. You know, I was thinking, we've seen hundreds of people healed today already, but if I was the only one that was praying for them and if it was all about me, then regardless, if we saw every single person healed, you go home and the next time sickness knocks on your door, we've got to have another healing is here conference or something, and that's just inefficient. But the way that we're approaching it, we're teaching you the Word and sharing with you. And I believe that you are going to be infected with this truth and that it is going to cause you to walk in healing even when you get back home and minister this to others. And this way, it'll spread like wildfire. Amen? So I am very, very excited about that. You know, we've got people downstairs. I was downstairs this morning at one of the sessions and sat down there, and man, those people are passionate. They were amening and shouting and screaming. It was exciting downstairs, too. So uh, welcome to all of them. And I heard that we had over 1,800 people back during the praise and worship service that were watching live stream. So I want to welcome all of you and just say what a blessing it is. And I believe that this is going to make a difference, not only in you, but in all of the people that, that this uh, you'll go out and represent and touch, change their lives. Tonight, I want to share some real simple things with you. There's so much to healing that I could minister for days, weeks. I have before <laughs> on healing. It's an inexhaustible subject because actually you could teach on just faith and apply it to anything. The same thing that works for finances, that works for joy, that works for peace, that works for anything. It works for healing. It's not like you have to have a special anointing for healing. And before I even get into this, let me just clarify one thing, that there, there's been a lot of confusion in the body of Christ because primarily the way that people have received healing over the last few decades is by some person who has an anointing on their life and they get people to believe in the anointing and the power that they have and they get people worked up to a position of faith and they have this moment of faith and they get healed. And that's primarily the way that the body of Christ has been receiving healing. And it does work that way. You can have a person with a gift of miracles or the gift of faith and they can pray for you and you can get healed off of their, off of their anointing. Now that doesn't exclude you having faith. You have to have some type of faith, but you can get healed off of another person's anointing. And that does happen, but I don't believe that that was ever intended to be God's best. That is not the way that God made it. I believe that the reason the Lord gave these gifts to people where they have special anointings is because if a person just got born again tonight, and if they had an incurable disease, and they only had a week to live, and yet it was going to take two years for them to grow in the Word and learn these things and begin to get their faith where it could work, well, then they would just be destined to die because they don't have time to grow and mature. So for cases like that, God gave these special anointings and gifts to people so that you could get healed with very little effort on your part and just receive through this supernatural gift. And I, I believe he did that because he loves us and he wants to meet you wherever you are. But it has become a very negative thing that the body of Christ has gotten to where that's all they know how to do is follow somebody around with an anointing on their life. And they have to have these special moments and special anointings to receive. That is very, very inefficient. God made it so that these signs will follow them that believe, not those that have special anointings, but Mark 16 says this will follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Jesus also said all things are possible to him that believes. You don't have to have a special anointing. You don't have to have somebody special. And this is another thing that is just thrilling me about what's happening, and that is that through CBC, not only myself, but all of the instructors, we're imparting the things that God has been showing us, and we are raising up people like Teresa here that is getting hold of the Word. She's getting healed by the Word. 
and you don't have to worry about is she going to be able to keep it because somebody else didn't get it for her through their faith. She got it by hearing the Word of God and she'll be able to maintain it that way. And that is exciting. And I believe we're moving into a new day, not that God has changed, but the revelation of this is coming forth and the very fact that you're here for a conference on healing where you are learning the Word. And hundreds of you were healed today by just hearing the truth and the revelation. I think that this, it's not a new way of receiving from the Lord. This is, I believe, God's number one way forever, but it's new to many of us. It's going to be new to the body of Christ. And I tell you, this is awesome. I, I just am so excited that uh, people are taking their attention off of a certain person or a certain anointing, and they're now looking to Jesus, and the Word is healing them. Hebrew, uh, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 4 says, The Word is health unto all of your flesh, and life unto them that find it. Psalms 107 verse 20 says, He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from all their diseases and destruction. And, it's, and Jesus, the greatest faith he said that he ever saw in Matthew chapter 8 was people, a man who said, I don't need you to come. I don't need to see you lay your hand on them. You speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus says, I've never seen this great a faith. No, not in Israel. It was a person who believed in the power of the spoken word. And I tell you, I believe that we're, I believe that this is like a fire that is going to, uh, catch on and praise God as you go back I believe that we're just going to see this spread and many people's lives change so anyway all that's introduction what I want to do tonight is just teach on what I consider five basics of healing or five essentials for healing I could I could have easily made 10 or 15 or 20 I just picked on some things and I have taught on every one of these things that I'm going to talk about tonight for multiple days two and three and four sessions on one thing. And so this is not going to be in depth. We've got Barry Bennett up tomorrow night. If you've never heard Barry Bennett minister, he's definitely one of the favorite teachers in our school. And then we have Dwayne Sheriff coming in on Thursday night. Dwayne and Sue are just awesome. They pastor eight churches in the Texas, New Mexico area, and Dwayne is one of the most powerful guys I'm listening to a series of his right now on healing, and it's just absolutely awesome. And then we got Greg Moore, who pastored for, what was it, 150 years? <laughs> I forget, but a long time. And now he's with us, and he's uh, our dean of students, is that correct? Education. Dean of education. And Greg is just a practical guy that uh, shares real simple truth. He's pastored for all of these years. And they're going to be awesome. And they will go into more depth. But I just want to kind of give you an overview of things that I consider to be essential for healing. Now, again, there are different ways to receive healing. And you can go to somebody and with a gift of healing. I've seen people get healed that basically were just very, very weak in faith. But there was just one of these special moments where their faith rose and the person's anointing got it. But I'm saying barring some supernatural intervention that you, it's kind of like lightning. You can't make that happen. You can't go and just make those special moments. God can do anything and people can get healed. And we hear these testimonies and if you aren't careful, it'll lead you into thinking that's the only way to receive from God. But the foundational way to receive from God is just through the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And it's like Carly said this morning, it's only the truth you know that sets you free. Truth doesn't set you free until you know it. So these are truths that if you're just going to receive from God based on your faith, these are things that I consider to be absolutely essential basics to receiving from God. And I'm just going to hit them real quickly, and I'm sure that during this week they will be expounded upon, and you'll get more... Uh, in depth. But you know, when Ashley was up here talking, uh, when they got that little cassette tape, I remember the night that I taught that in Shreveport, Louisiana, and it was one of the strangest ministries I ever had. This was about 30 something years ago, and I still remember that night. And I just, I don't know for what reason, but I just gave them everything I knew in one and a half hours. I told them everything. Didn't explain a single thing. It was like, 
drinking from a fire hose. And I remember thinking this is just, I don't know what good this is ever going to do, but that's the one that Ashley and Carly listened to, and it just lit a fire on the inside of them. And uh, so anyway, it's going to be a similar type of thing. I'm not going to give you quite everything I know, but I'm going to share a lot of things with you, and I think that this will help. And then during the week, you'll get a lot more answers and a lot more detail on this. But to me, one, the starting place, if you've ever heard my teaching on God Wants You Well, the starting place with me is to believe that it is God's will for you to be well. If you waver in that at all, then you aren't going to receive from the Lord. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all man liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And you can apply that to all kinds of things, but it applies to healing. If you waver and think, well, is it God's will to heal me or isn't it God's will to heal me? If you waver, the scripture says you receive nothing from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable. And this is where I started out. We were taught that healing passed away with the apostles, that at the end of the first century there was no more healing. And I was taught that. And because of it, I wasn't absolutely certain that it was God's will to heal. You are not going to get healed based on your faith and the truth and the revelation of God if you waver on this point. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire to Him. But you have to know it's God's will. If you waver on that, you will not receive healing through your faith. You might bump into healing through somebody else. It's got a gift of anointing and an, an anointing on them, but you aren't going to get healed if you waver in this area. You've got to know that it's God's will. And I literally, I've got about five or six things listed here that tradition has taught that compromise your belief that it's God's will to heal you. And I could preach on every one of these for over an hour. I have in the past. I'm just going to say this real quickly. I'm assuming that those of you who are here, those of you that are watching live stream, are the ones who believe it's God's will to heal. And so I'm not going to just focus on this, uh, but I'm not going to take it for granted either because people waver in this thing. So this thing about, you know, uh, healing passed away, that's one of the big things that we were taught. And I believe that this is an attempt to excuse our lack of seeing healing today. It's motivated by selfishness excusing our inability to heal people. And uh, anyway, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's wrong. It's wrong. The scripture says that Jesus, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he has ever healed people, he will still heal people. It is God's will for you to be well. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but you need to recognize that it happens. And either you're going to have to believe that what Carly, when she was sharing these testimonies, and people raised their hands and said they're healed, and they were all throughout this auditorium. You're either going to have to believe that these people lied, that they're totally deceived, or something, but we've had multiple testimonies that God heals today. If He's healed one today, then He heals all. And so anyway, you just need to put that to rest, that God heals today, it did not pass away with the Apostle. And also, this is a big one with me, was that Satan uh, put into the church and the church actually promoted that God uses sickness to punish you or to teach you something. That was a big one. It was really big to me because I thought that God uses sickness to punish us and to teach us something. And again, I could preach on this for hours, but I'm just saying that is not true. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. They were not oppressed of God. They were oppressed of the devil. 
The scripture says, you know, I've already quoted that scripture that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. If you think God gives sickness and then he turns around and heals sickness, that's double-mindedness. It's schizophrenic. God's not unstable in all of his ways. God doesn't put sickness on you so they can turn around and heal it. Somebody's thinking, well, now, wait a minute. In the Old Testament, I can show you people that God smote with, with uh, leprosy. I can show you like Uzziah went in and offered a sacrifice. And because of it, the leprosy of God came up in his forehead. Miriam had leprosy. Uh, there are scriptures, Deuteronomy chapter 28, that if you don't serve the Lord, if you don't observe his sayings, he'll put the botch and the emrods and the mildew and... All of these other things on you. I don't even know what all those are, but I don't want them. Amen. <laughs> and somebody says, well, God said he'd do that. Absolutely. Now, see here, I, again, I don't want to stay here. I could spend a lot of time here. But a lot of people who try and preach that it's God's will for you to be healed, they just dismiss these things and say, oh, no, God never did this. Uh, he allowed it instead of causing it. That's not true. If you study it, God smote people with sickness and disease. But you can never find that it was a blessing. It was always a punishment. It was a curse. And the Bible says that God placed our curse upon Jesus. Jesus became a curse for us. And now only good and perfect gifts come from the Lord. In James chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, it says, uh, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And it says, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. That means he never changes. This is absolutely the way he is. God does not put sickness on us. In the Old Testament, he did as a punishment. But in the New Testament, Jesus bore our punishment, bore our curse. And you are never being punished by God with sickness. Well, that is a big, big statement. And I know that that's a big issue with some people. I didn't do justice to it, but I've got other things I want to share. So uh, let me also, here's another thing under this first deal about you've got to know that it's God's will. And people have been taught that God is sovereign that nothing can happen. Even if it's the devil that's attacking you, the devil couldn't attack you if God didn't allow it. That is not true. If you're clapping for that, you're wrong. I'm preaching against that. There are people that are taught that God controls everything. If you really believe that, then here's a real simple way to deal with that. Well, then throw away your medicine. Quit going to the doctor. Why would you want to get out of God's will if God's the one that willed you to be sick? If God put this on you, if God has some redemptive purpose in it, then quit trying to get out of God's will by getting well. Just let it run its full course. Quit taking painkillers so that you get the maximum pain out of it and you learn the maximum stuff. That's not true. And I know that this sovereignty of God, in my opinion, it's the only opinion I've got, but in my opinion, the sovereignty of God is the worst heresy in the body of Christ. Now, there is a proper use of the word sovereignty, but the way that it's used in religion today is ungodly. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say what I wanted to say because I'll have to explain it if I do. But let me just say that this is not true that God puts everything and that God allows everything. We're the ones that are allowing sickness. We're the ones that ate of the forbidden tree. We're the ones that initiated sin and sickness and death. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, I forget the exact verse, but it's around verse 14 or 15, that he came to deliver those who through all their lifetime were subject to death through fear and deliver them from Satan who had the power of death. Satan is the one that has the power of death. God, God doesn't control who dies. When people die, they say, well, their number must have been up. They're implying that God was responsible. They say, well, you know, if God wanted to, he could have healed them. That's not true. 
God is not the one who started sickness and disease. He gave us this authority and power. And God does not override our will and our choices. And he doesn't come and just instantly wipe everything away. Anyway, I could really preach against this wrong use of the sovereignty of God. But I'm telling you, this is a hindrance with a lot of people. They think, God, why haven't you healed me yet? It's not God's fault. God does not control everything that happens to you. And if you believe that, I can guarantee you, Satan will kill you. I've had, I couldn't even count the number of friends, ministers, pastors who believed in the sovereignty of God who died because of that doctrine. They're dead because of that doctrine. It is a deadly doctrine. God gave us control. We are the ones that are responsible for releasing the healing power of God. It's not our power, it's God's power, but it's inside of us. And the reason people aren't being healed today is like, Jesus, like uh, the scripture says, that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. It's our ignorance that's killing us. Some of you have seen these bumper stickers that says, what you don't know won't hurt you. That's not true. What you don't know is killing you. Amen. So ignorance will allow Satan to make you think that it's not God's will to heal you. And the last thing I'm going to say on this is that Jesus, to me, is the supreme example. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't do anything of myself. I only do what I see the Father do. And Jesus never, ever made one person sick. Jesus never refused to heal one single person. And if Jesus' statements were true, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I act just like the Father. I don't do my own will. I don't say what I want to say. I say only what my Father told me to say. If all that's true, which it is, then Jesus would have misrepresented God if God is the one that puts sickness and disease and problems. And if God just allowed it, well, then Jesus misrepresented God because he never, never refused to heal a single person. I can show you a couple of instances where people refused to accept healing from him. And it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, that he could do, not that he wouldn't do, but he could do no mighty work because of their unbelief, not his unbelief, their unbelief. And so there are a couple of instances where Jesus could not heal people. You can see the same thing in the apostles, in the book of Acts and other places. But you can't find a single person where Jesus ever put sickness on, ever said, no, you haven't learned your lesson yet. You've got to suffer a little bit longer or anything else. So if you really believe that Jesus is a perfect representation, the exact image of the Father, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, then you've got to take Jesus as an example and say it's not God's will to put sickness on us. The only time God ever struck people with sickness was in punishment and judgment and our judgment's been placed upon Jesus so in the new covenant we don't deal with that. Amen? So that's really quick. I could have spent a week on that but that's number one essential I believe for healing is that you've got to believe it's God's will to heal you and you cannot waver on that. But let me say that there's a lot of people who believe that God wants them well and yet they're still sick. I bet you there's a lot of people right here and a lot of people watching online that you are struggling with manifesting a healing and you can't understand it because you believe God wants you well. So here's some other things. I believe that that is a first step. I believe it's absolutely a foundation and it's essential, but that is not all that there is to healing. And again, I can't show you in scripture that this is an inspired list. These are just things as I've dealt with things over the years that I've learned. And one of the next things that I consider to be a basic or very essential to receiving healing by your faith is to recognize God has already done his part. It says in 1 Peter 2:24, by his stripes you were healed. Jesus isn't healing people today. And I know some of you may be shocked saying, what are you saying? Jesus has already done it. 2,000 years ago, it says, by his stripes we were healed. His stripes were taken during that time of crucifixion. It was in Herod's judgment hall, and that was 2,000 years ago. Jesus isn't taking stripes on his body tonight. 
Jesus isn't healing people tonight. He healed you 2,000 years ago. His part is already done. And he is now seated at the Father's right hand. He is not uh, bearing your sins and sicknesses and suffering for you. It's already been done. The curse of sin has been broken. Jesus has paid for every person's sickness. Man, I wish I had time to go over to Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 and show you that he was marred so much that he didn't even look human. His visage, his face was worse than any human face has ever been. It wasn't the Romans beating that did that. He took your sickness, your sin, your disease into his body. Every pain that you've ever had, Jesus experienced that on the cross. And not just yours, but the entire human race. All of the sickness and disease, all of the swollen heads, all of the deformities, elephantitis, these boils, anything that the human race has ever suffered came into Jesus' body. And all of the sickness of the human race came into him. And that's why Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 says he didn't even look human. He's already borne your sickness. If Jesus bore it, there's no reason for you and me to bear it. Jesus suffered these things. And it is, his part is done. One of the greatest revelations that God ever gave me is in a series that I called, You've Already Got It. That you're already blessed. He's already done everything. And some of you are thinking, well, but it's not true for me because you're only looking in the physical realm. You're looking on the outward man. You're looking at what the doctor says. You're going by what you feel in your body. But in the spirit realm, if you've been born again, you have the same spirit on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And it's not a tiny bit of that spirit. It's not like you've got it in mustard seed form and now you've got to grow and mature your spiritual man. That's not true. Your spirit man is perfect. It was born again, perfect and complete and completely mature. Your spirit isn't growing. You aren't getting the word into your spirit. Your spirit's perfect. It's your brain that's the problem. We are trying to renew our minds so that we can understand and draw out what's in our spirit. But you have the fullness of God on the inside of you. You've got the same power, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. You have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not out there. See, if you understood this, this would get rid of so much religious junk about how we got to bind the demonic powers and create a hole in the heavens so that our prayers can get up to God. Man, I'm not going to stay on this because I got other things I want to say. But that's just dumb, dumb. That's dumb to the second power, dumb, dumb. Somebody said, well, Daniel, in the book of Daniel, the demonic powers blocked his prayer. That was an Old Testament man. It also says in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 64, I believe it's verse 6, rend the heavens and come down. I've heard people pray that my whole life. Oh, God, send revival. Rend the heavens and come down. Just send your healing. Put forth your healing hand and touch this person. He already did it. He rent the heavens and came down through Jesus. He suffered for everybody's sins and sickness and disease. And Jesus is now seated at the Father's right hand. You don't need to get your prayers up past the demons and through some hole in the clouds up to God. God lives here on the inside of you. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray so you can look at God. You say, Father, this whole thing is, is a misunderstanding of what Jesus has done, or in ignorance. I'm telling you, Jesus has already done his part. If you're begging God to heal you, you're wasting your time. God's already healed you. It's not up to God to heal you. Amen. Somebody, well, where does that leave me? Because if he's already done it, I'm sick. Again, you're only looking on the outside, on the inside. You have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And it's not based on your holiness, on your goodness, whether you fasted and prayed and done all of the right things. It's already on the inside of you. The only thing you got to do to release it is renew this mind. 
And when you start seeing who you are and what you have in Christ and your authority, well then this power that's on the inside starts flowing through you and manifesting itself on the outside. But the first step is to understand what you've already got. I think that this morning they quoted that verse out of Philemon chapter 1 verse 6 where he said, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual, that means it would begin to work, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. It didn't say your faith begins effectual, becomes effectual by begging God for more. Oh God, give me more faith. Oh God, send revival. Oh God, touch me. Oh God, give me a double portion. See, that's the way the body of Christ has been operating. But instead, it becomes effectual by acknowledging. You can't acknowledge something that doesn't already exist. By acknowledging the good things that are already in you in Christ Jesus. And our ignorance of who we are and what we have in Christ is one of the biggest blockages to us receiving healing from God because we approach God as a beggar. Oh God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing, but I know that you can do anything. You'll die praying a prayer like that. That's wrong. You know, if I was God, which certainly I am not, but if I was God, I think I'd look at Jesus and say, didn't you tell them that they have the same power that raised you from the dead? Didn't you tell them the works that I did you can do also? Didn't you tell them that? I mean, if God could be confused, he'd be confused with the way that people approach him. I have people come to me by the thousands and they, they love to make their situation this huge, impossible situation and solicit pity. I'm nothing. I can do nothing. The doctor says, I'm going to die. Would you please pray for me? If I was God, I'd just drop kick you off into space. God has done everything for you. God's part's done. Jesus said it's finished. You're already healed. Healing is yours. You don't have to ask for healing. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to live and do certain things to get healed. Healing is the children's bread is what Jesus said. It belongs to you. It's already accomplished. If you're sick, it's with your unbelief that is what's causing the problem. God's already done his part. And once you know that, that's not all that there is to healing. But I tell you what, that is huge. That's huge. If you know that you have the healing power of God in here somewhere, you won't get discouraged. You won't quit. You'll just stick with it. If you have to, you'll push your Bible around for eight hours with your nose saying, I know it's here somewhere. And you'll stick with it until you eventually get it. An old blind squirrel will get a nut every once in a while if he doesn't quit. If you just were absolutely convinced, Father, I believe I'm healed. I believe that by your stripes I was healed. I'm not going to be healed. I was healed. If you believe that, you would eventually stumble on the healing. It would just happen nearly accidentally. Man, this is huge. Again, I could teach on... Matter of fact, I do have a teaching on this for about eight hours, amen. But anyway, that was not two. And let me just say this one last thing. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is what God does. And grace is independent of you. It's not based on your performance. Matter of fact, all of the grace of God was manifested in Jesus. It says the law came by Moses... But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. And so all of God's grace was poured out through Jesus, and that was 2,000 years ago. Jesus hadn't died since then. So all of the grace of God towards you was manifested 2,000 years ago before you and I lived, before we had a problem, before we had a need. So God, by grace, healed us 2,000 years ago before you ever got sick how could you possibly believe that this is tied to your goodness, to your holiness, to your performance? It was done. 
Well, somebody says, well, if it's done, well, then how come it's not done? How come I still have this pain? How come the doctors are still saying this? Because grace is God's part. Faith is our part. And here is a huge misconception. And I've got an entire series on this, living in the balance of grace and faith. And most people believe faith is something you do to make God move. That's wrong. Faith only appropriates what God has already provided by grace. If God hasn't already provided it, then you can't make him do it. If you understood this simple principle, and I hope somebody expounds on this this week, but if you understand this principle, well then it takes all of the struggle out of it because it's already done. The only struggle that you've got is to renew your mind and start trusting, resting in what Jesus did instead of swallowing the lie that I've got to be holy enough, I've got to do something to earn this, to make God move, and on and on. Man, there's just so many things I could say about this, but this is just major. You've got to believe that God's already done His part. It's through. It's finished. And that is huge. When I began to understand this, it's like I went to a whole new level in seeing healing in myself and in other people. This will make a huge, huge difference in your life. Number three here, if you're keeping track, is that you are the ones that now have authority over sickness and disease. I've got a teaching that goes along with this entitled The Authority of the Believer, what you never learned in church. And really, most of the problems that people come to me with could be solved if they just knew their authority. But they, are, they believe that God can heal. They may even believe it's His will to heal. But they are just waiting. They ask and then they wait as if it's up to God whether you get healed. It's not up to God whether you get healed. I got, I got uh, Daniel and Tracy down here saying amen. The rest of you are looking shocked. But look in, look in uh, Matthew chapter 10. Let me just read these verses to you. I've been quoting a lot of verses because I can cover more ground that way. But you need to go study these out and get to where they're in your heart. But in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He gave them, his disciples, and we are now the them. We are now the ones who have this power. It did not end with the first century apostles. You know, a real powerful passage of scripture on that is, is Acts chapter 3 where Peter and John were going into the temple and they healed the man who was lame at the gate of the temple. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. And... Uh, and the people looked on them and he says, why are you looking on us as though we by our own power or holiness had made this man to walk? But be it no made known unto you by that by the name of Jesus, through faith in his name, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness which you see in here today. He said that it was the name of Jesus and faith in the name of Jesus that produced this miracle of a man who had never walked. He was 38 years old. You find that in the next chapter, of chapter 4. And 38 years, he had never walked. That means that there was no muscles there. This was more than just a healing. This was a miracle. He was instantly given muscles and coordination. He had never learned to walk. And yet he went walking and leaping and praising God. And he said it was the name of Jesus through faith in his name. We still have the name of Jesus because you can't be saved by any other name. And it's faith. By grace are you saved through faith. So we still got the name of Jesus and faith in his name. And that means that therefore any type of miracle like this can happen. It did not pass away with the apostles. God gave us this authority in Matthew chapter 8. He continues here and he tells his disciples... In verse 7, Matthew chapter 8, excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I could spend a long time on this, but this phrase, at hand, simply means that it's not off in the future, it's now. The kingdom of heaven is here. Healing is here. Yes. And again, this 
this lack of understanding is reflected in so many things that we say in the body of Christ. Like there is coming a great move of God. God is going to do this. God is going to move. There is coming a day. Nearly every prophecy you will hear about the power of God is off in the future. The body of Christ is headed towards a victory in their mind, but the truth is we are coming from a victory. It was accomplished 2,000 years ago. His part is done. And he says, go preach and say the kingdom of heaven is here. It's now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to go somewhere else. It's here now. Praise God. And in verse 8 he said, this is a command. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. You've already got it. God's already done it. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, you're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You have the same power living on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not out there. It's not a prize to be earned. It is already in you. If you are born again, you have the same power in you that raised Christ from the dead. And if somebody says, I don't think I do, well, then you aren't born again. Because Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ on the inside of you, then you aren't truly born again. If you do have the Spirit of Christ, then you have the power, the one who was raised from the dead, and the power that raised him from the dead. You've already got it. And this authority has been given unto you. Now you have to use it. Going back to Acts chapter 3, where this man was healed at the gate of the temple, it, uh, the, it says that Peter and John looked on him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk and they didn't even pray a prayer they reached down and grabbed him by the hand and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he went walking and leaping and praising God they never prayed for the man they never asked God to heal they didn't say oh God we are nothing we can do nothing we have nothing but we know you can do all things that's the way religion prays and you know what that's a chicken way of praying Because God, it's not up to me. I have nothing. I, I, it's all you. Oh, Lord, would you stretch forth your hand? And if they get healed, you say, oh, well, praise God. And if they die and don't get healed, well, must not have been God's will. God works in mysterious ways. But when you sit here and start saying, I'm supposed to go heal the sick. I'm supposed to cleanse the leper. God gave me power over all the power of the enemy, over all sickness and over all disease. And in the name of Jesus, I take authority and command. You know what? That's risky praying. Carly and Daniel were talking about that this morning, about the fear of what happens if, you know, I pray and nothing happens. I guarantee you, you're going to have to deal with this if you quit begging God and saying, God, if it's your will, heal. And you start saying, no, it is your will. You've already done it. You gave this power to me. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And you reach down and just grab him by the hand and jerk him up. You know, I took this passage of scripture when we were in Seagoville, Texas. And there was a man that brought his son to me. And his son uh, didn't have any vocal cords. He was born without vocal cords. And he wanted me to pray for him. Anyway, it's a long story. But I, I never did pray for this guy. I just said, in the name of Jesus, I command vocal cords to come into you. And I commanded him to start talking. And he opened up his mouth and nothing had come out. And I said, are you born again? He shook his head, yes. And I said, are you baptized in the Holy Spirit? He shook his head, no. And I said, well, man, that would help. I said, you need the power of God on the inside of you. So I prayed for him and prayed that he would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I said, now start speaking in tongues. And he just started speaking in tongues. He was like 40 years old and had never spoken before. First words he ever spoke were tongues. <laughs> Amen. Wasn't that neat? And after it was over, I thought, I never did pray for this guy. And then I thought, well, it worked, so I guess it, it was all right. You know what? We have authority. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Jesus had spoken to the fig tree, and he commanded no man to ever eat of that fig tree again. And the next day, 24 hours later, this is a good illustration for healing, that he spoke, and nothing looked 
like it had changed immediately, but the next day, 24 hours later, the fig tree was dead, and it says it was dried up from the roots. That means that the moment Jesus spoke, it was dead, but it just took 24 hours for the death that was under the ground in the roots to manifest in the physical realm. The moment you speak, if you believe, it's done. You're healed, but it may take a period of time for that healing to manifest, for your body to recover and stuff like that. So anyway, that's a, another teaching, but that's a great truth. And he spoke to the fig tree, and when his disciples the next day saw this fig tree dried up from the roots, they were shocked. And they said, Master, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. And he said, Have faith in God. And I don't believe it was like, Have faith in God. It was like, have faith in God. Like, what's wrong with you guys? You've seen me raise the dead. You've seen me do all of these things. And you're still shocked that I can talk to a tree and kill it with my words. And then he's told them in, in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, that verse that Kenneth Hagin wrote. Amen. <laughs> Kenneth preached on this so much that people thought he wrote it. But it was just a supernatural revelation that changed his life. And it says, For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. There's a lot in that verse. But let me just point out, he said, Whosoever will say to this mountain, not say to God about this mountain, now see, most people don't meditate on the word and get this revelation, but this is tremendous revelation. For you to not go to God and say, oh God, I've got this mountain, I've got this problem. Would you please take it away? God, would you please remove this? See, that's the way that the body of Christ prays. He didn't say to talk to God about your problem. He said, talk to your problem about God. Tell your problem to be cast into the sea. Implied in that, if you think this through, means that you understand God has done his part and he gave that power and authority to you and you are taking your authority and speaking directly to the problem instead of asking God to deal with it. God is the one who has already done everything. Now it's up to you whether Satan flees from you. You have to resist the devil. James chapter 4 verse 7, and he will flee from you. You have to fight sickness and disease. You have to talk to it. This has been a real breakthrough in my life. When I started saying, pain in the name of Jesus, leave, it works. You know, a classic example, I know many of you have heard me give this, but it's still good. It's awesome. Anyway, I, uh, people were watching the healing journey of uh, Nikki Oshinsky, the very first person we ever put on one of our healing journeys. And she was in constant pain for four or five years. Was The doctor said he never expected to see her. And anyway, she got healed. The people saw that testimony and asked uh, if I would pray for this woman. And I said, sure. And they said, well, she's already on her way. She'll be here in five minutes. I prayed for this woman. This woman had all kinds of wrong thinking. She thought God gave her that sickness. God was getting glorified. And so I taught her some of the things that I taught you tonight, that no, God didn't give her this sickness. That it's God's will for her to be well. And I countered all of her doctrine. And after about 20 minutes of stuff, she says, all right, I'm ready to believe. So I prayed for her. I rebuked pain, spoke to the pain and commanded pain to leave her body. She'd had pain for seven years. The doctor said on a scale of one to 10, her pain was a constant 11. And she had magnets taped to her body and then magnets sewn into a blanket that she wrapped herself in. And somehow this magnetic field lessened the pain and she had survived two years after the doctor said she'd be dead. But she was just in terrible shape. I prayed with her, commanded the pain to leave and she took this blanket off, stood up, moved around. She says, I don't have any pain. First time in seven years that she had been pain free. But then she says, I have this burning or this stinging right here in my waist in the back. What's, what's the deal with that? And I said, you didn't tell me you had stinging. You told me you had pain. I didn't talk to stinging. 
So I said, watch this. And I spoke to stinging and commanded stinging to be gone. And it was gone. Amen. And then I took Mark chapter 11, verse 23, and taught her these things. Man, I'm talking as fast as I can talk. <laughs> I hadn't got time to... Let me just say this. Healing, faith, is voice activated. God created the heavens and the earth by words. Your body, every virus, every bacteria, trees, respond to words. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and cursed it and it died. Words are the parent creative force of all living matter. Words will affect your body, will affect sickness, disease. It affects the devil. You overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Words are powerful. Words are how you release your faith. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Words are how you release your faith. So we, I spoke to that woman's body and pain to the stinging in the left. I taught her these things. And as she was getting ready to leave, it was like 45 minutes after she first came in, probably 20 minutes after she was healed, and I had given her some instruction. She was getting ready to leave. She put her hand on the doorknob, and she just froze, and she turned around and looked at me, and she says, the stinging is back. And I said, well, I've been teaching you what to do. So I said, I want you to pray. I'll let you lead the prayer, and I'll agree with you. So I just joined hands with this woman, and she started praying. And you got to remember that 45 minutes before, she was a Presbyterian. <laughs> that believed God made her sick to get glory out of it. She didn't know come here from Sikkim about the Word of God. Many of you don't know come here from Sikkim either. In Texas, that's the way we say Sikkim is like you say Sikkim to a dog. That's go away, go get them. Come here is the opposite. And so if you don't know come here from Sikkim, you don't know very much, amen. <laughs> So anyway, this woman, just 45 minutes before, had been basically ignorant of these things. I taught her the word, and she prayed a great prayer for a person that had been a Presbyterian 45 minutes before. And she, this is nearly word for word what she said. She says, Father, I thank you that by your stripes I was healed. If I was healed, I am healed. It is your will to heal me. I claim my healing in Jesus' name. By your stripes I was healed. And when she got through, I said, so, do you still have the burning? And she says, yes. And I said, do you know why? And she said, no. And I said, that's not a good prayer. <laughs> Most of you are thinking, well, that's a great prayer. Those are all nice things to say, but it's not doing what Jesus told us to do. He told you to speak to the problem. She spoke to God and said wonderful things about Jesus and about it being His will. And those are good things to say. And by saying those things, she may have had faith come to her ears because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. So it may have built her up and helped her some. But it didn't do what God told her to do. And I said, the reason you still have that stinging is because you didn't talk to the stinging. And this woman says, you mean I'm supposed to say stinging? and talk to it like it's a person? I said, absolutely. She said, I'll do it. And so we joined hands again and she said, she got mad. She said, stinging in the name of Jesus. And she stopped and she says, it's gone. That's all she had to say. Amen. See, that's understanding your authority. It is God's will for you to be well. That's number one. Number two, God's already done His part. He's already healed you. You don't have to approach Him as a beggar and ask and wonder, will He do it? He's already done it. Now it's up to you to take your authority and you resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4 verse 7. You have to build yourself up. You've probably heard some people talk about confessing the word, you know, 500 times. By his stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. And on the 500th time, they get healed. Some people interpret that, that it takes 500 times of saying something before God will move. That's not true. God moved 2,000 years ago. It took 500 times for you to break through your unbelief and to believe 
All you got to do is believe and say it one time. With the heart man believes, Romans chapter 10 and verse uh, 11 says, With the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You got to believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth. This all goes back to the authority of the believer and your authority is released through words. It's voice activated. Man, I could just expand on this for days. But some of us are hung by our tongue. <laughs> Somebody says, how are you? Oh, man, I, how much time do you have? And you just start telling them, I got this ache, I got this pain. The doctor says, I'm dying. And you are killing yourself with your words. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. It didn't say only life, death and life. You can, you can kill yourself with your words, and most of us are. Most of us are saying things like, well, I'm only human. I'm just a man. That's a lie. I'm not only human. I'm not just a man. One third of me is wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. People will sit there and quote Jesus from John, in John chapter 15, I believe it's verse 4, without me you can do nothing, and they say, I'm just nothing. That's, that's a lie. Somebody said, well, well, Jesus said it. No, he didn't. He said, without me, you can do nothing. But I'm never without him. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. So for me to just focus on my physical, mental limitations and not acknowledge who I am and what God has put on the inside of me is wrong. And if that's what I start speaking, that, oh, God, I am nothing, I have nothing, I can do nothing, it'll kill me. I'm speaking death. I got to quit speaking death. I got to start speaking life. All of this is bound up in the authority of the believer. You got to understand your authority. And I hadn't even got time. I'll just touch on this and move on. But the church has given Satan way too much authority. We think that Satan is superior to us. Satan got his authority from you and from me. He can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. That is a huge statement right there. A lot of people think that Satan is this angel who has this superior angelic power. Satan lost his angelic power when he rebelled at God and he got his authority and power from mankind. He is using a usurped, stolen, physical, natural authority. And if you don't cooperate with him in your actions and in your thoughts, Satan can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. Whatever the devil's doing to you, you're the one that loaded the weapon for him and pointed it at you. You can take that away. So you've got to understand the authority that God has given us and realize that you aren't waiting on God. God is waiting on you to stand up and take your authority and resist the devil. People, in a sense, they probably wouldn't say it this way, but they're saying, oh God, please resist the devil for me. That's what you're asking when you're asking God to heal you and you're asking God to prosper you or whatever. You're asking God to do what he told you to do. He told you to resist the devil. You to fight against the devil. You to do something. You got to resist the devil. All of that is involved in your authority. Number four, if you are taking notes, I've already been saying this, but you have to resist the devil. Take this authority and use it against the devil. And the way you resist him, in uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And I hadn't got time to really develop this, but much of sickness, not all sickness, but much sickness is demonic. It's not organic, it's not physical, it's spiritual. And in our society today, this is not popular. Matter of fact, if I was on a, if I was in a secular venue here today, if it wasn't people who've already heard me and came here pretty much in agreement or something, if I was in if I went into the average church today and started saying that your sickness is demonic, I guarantee you there would be a uproar. People would just, 
they would they they don't believe in that stuff and then some who might believe that those things exist they believe it's all over in Africa somewhere they don't believe it's here but if you study the healings of Jesus at least half of Jesus healings were by casting demons out and rebuking things Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law by rebuking the fever over her he cast demons out of people who were deaf and dumb and blind. Those were all demonic. Those were spiritual things. I was talking to Oral Roberts just a few months before he died, and he said that the greatest miracles he ever saw were when demons were the source of it, and you cast them out. And that's when you see instant manifestation. Sometimes if it's not demonic, you just pray for a person, and the disease is gone, and then it takes time for their body to recover. But when it's demonic, instantly all of the symptoms are gone because it was that demon that was causing those things. So you've got to recognize this goes along with taking your authority, but you have to take that authority and use it against the devil and resist the devil. Again, James 4, 7, I've used that a bunch, but you have to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And here's another application of this. Some of you aren't going to like this one. You may not have liked any of the others either. <laughs> but you know what? You can't be cooperating with the devil through sowing to the flesh and then expect to be healed. Now there's many, many applications of this. And there needs to be some wisdom applied to this because you could take what I'm saying wrong. But let, let's just take an example. If you're hundreds of pounds overweight, you are cooperating with the devil. You are giving him inroad into your life. You know, if you came up here for prayer tonight, and I've used, I, I have these feed sacks that I use, and these feed sacks are 50 pounds a piece, and I carry these feed sacks and do things. If I had two of those feed sacks buckled to my belly, and I had to walk up here and straddle with those two feed sacks. And I had a hundred pounds and I came up and I said, I've got back problems, would you please pray for me? Well man, I'd pray for you, but I'd undo those feed sacks and let them drop on the ground. Because you are going to have back problems if you're a hundred pounds overweight. You are going to have problems with sugar diabetes and you are going to have things that happen when you don't take care of your body. And you can sit there and, and use your faith and drive diabetes out the door by your faith. And he'll come right back in the other door with seven demons worse because you are enabling him by the way that you live. I figured that'd go over about like that. Some of you think, oh, I thought you was a grace preacher. I am a grace preacher. You know what? You come up here and you're 200 pounds overweight, I'll pray for you and I can make the pain in your back stop. I can release healing and the pain will leave and you'll be healed. And then tomorrow you'll have that pain again because you've still got the same problem that produced it. God won't withhold healing from you, but you are just continuing to allow the devil to come back in. And it's not only with health issues and stuff like that, uh, physical things, but did you know there's people that are out here living in sin and in rebellion towards God. Now again, do I believe that you have to be holy for God to heal you? No. I can show you many examples of people who are addicts, uh, drug addicts, uh, alcoholics, living in homosexuality, all kinds of sexual perversion who get healed and stuff. God does not reject you because of some impurity in your life. But if you come and you get healed and then you go right back into your perversion and into living in rebellion towards God. Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And so if you yield yourself to sin, you are yielding yourself to Satan, the author of that sin, and you are allowing him to come in to steal, kill, and to destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. So yes, God will heal you if you're a homosexual. Yes, God will heal you if you're living in sexual immorality. Yes, God will heal you if you haven't been studying the word and praying. God loves you and God will experience healing, express healing to you and then Satan will come right back in because you leave the door open and welcomed him in.
So when I'm saying that you have to resist the devil, this is more than just saying, in the name of Jesus, Satan, leave me alone. You have to start, quit living a life that gives Satan an inroad into your life. Not in order for God to heal you, but in order for you to keep that healing because you are just cooperating with the devil and Satan is going to do what he can to steal from you. Amen or oh me? Amen. Another application of this is the same principle as James chapter 3 verse 16. He says, but where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Every evil work. Now, we could talk about a lot of things, but if we're applying this to healing, you could say cancer is an evil work. You could say arthritis is an evil work. You could say all of these sicknesses and diseases are evil works. And if you are in envy and strife, it will produce confusion and then every evil work. There are people that would never go to a seance they would never just have some kind of a thing where they commit themselves to the devil and do a sacrifice and want the devil to come possess them. But man, they are mean as a snake. They're just angry. They're bitter. They're operating in unforgiveness. They gossip. They talk about people. They criticize this. They're just mean. And then they wonder why they've got problems. Where envy and strife is, there is every evil work. Every evil work. That's one of the most sweeping statements in the entire Bible. There's lots of things you can do that don't open the door to everything that the devil's got. But when you are in envy and strife, you throw the door open to every evil work. I ministered in Corpus Christi, Texas one time, and this church, I had ministered there before, they just, they believed God could heal, but it was totally up to him whether he would or wouldn't. And they had gotten hold of the word, they had started preaching that it is God's will to heal every person, every time, if we don't see it, it's not God's fault, it's us that missed it. And they began to start preaching this, and the church was beginning to start operating in healing. And then, just two days before I got there, they had a funeral for a high school boy who died and he was in a coma for about a week or so and the entire church fasted and prayed for him to be healed and when I got there they were just devastated because they couldn't understand why he wasn't healed if it was God's will to heal the whole church fasted and prayed they were believing God and they couldn't understand why this boy wasn't healed and so on the Sunday morning I was there for a whole week and on the Sunday morning the pastor told me about this, introduced me to the parents of that boy, and I went out to eat with them every day during that week, trying to minister to them and give them some comfort. And I started asking them questions, and anyway, the long and the short of it is that the reason this boy was in a coma was because the day that this happened, his uh, parents were fighting, and they were so angry, there was so much anger in the home that it had boiled over into this kid and the mother and the son had an argument and she just got mad and said, I hate you, don't ever come back again. So the boy went to high school, he was so distraught over this that during school he wasn't supposed to leave the school grounds but he went off campus with one of his friends, they went over to a house and they played Russian roulette with a pistol and he shot himself in the head and that's the reason he was in a coma and the whole church fasted and prayed and they just couldn't understand why he wasn't healed. But see, faith doesn't overcome ignorance. It doesn't overcome all of these kind of things. Sometimes you have to literally shut the door. You have to repent and where envy and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. And it liter Satan literally took this boy's life and he died and they thought God was the one that failed. No, it was them. They allowed the devil to come in and still kill and destroy. And you can't fast and pray and overcome five years worth of strife and envy in the home. Amen or oh me? Is this to say that until you get your home perfect, God won't move? Until you quit being everything, God won't heal you? No. You can repent right now. And through repenting, you can literally stop the inroad that Satan has had for years. You can shut the door. Praise God for mercy and grace. 
and you can be healed. I don't care what's going on in your life. But, don't go back and start doing the same thing that caused the problem in the first place or you're just going to allow the devil to come back seven times worse. Jesus, in the fifth chapter of the book of John, told the man this at the pool of Bethesda. He healed him, and then later the man came to him, and Jesus said, Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Jesus linked that sickness to sin. Not all sickness is sin. You know what? If you fall off of a ladder and break a bone, it's not sin. We got a law of gravity, and if you don't cooperate properly with it, your, things happen. I knew a guy one time that was roofing, I, uh, or not roofing, he was driving a cement nail and the thing broke and bounced off the cement and stuck in his eye. And uh, he had problems because he had a nail sticking in his eye. And that wasn't necessarily sin, they're just physical things that happen. If you go around a corner too fast, you're going to have a wreck and it's not necessarily sin. That could have been sin, you could have been drunk or something, or angry or bitter. I'm not saying that in every situation, but it's just too simplistic to say that sin is what causes every single sickness and disease. But in the fifth chapter of the book of John, Jesus linked sickness to sin and said, if, don't go sin again, lest a worse thing come upon you. And he showed that Satan could gain access to you through sin. So I believe that God heals us independent of our sin or holiness. You do not have to be holy to get God to heal you. But you come down here and get healed and then you get into strife and anger and bitterness and go back to the same things that caused your life to be so messed up and Satan's going to come back in and you will lose. It's really incorrect to say lose that healing, but you will start experiencing sickness again uh, if you just go out and don't resist the devil with your lifestyle. Resisting the devil is more than just getting angry and telling the devil to leave you alone. Resisting the devil is living holy and living right, and seeking God. Amen. There's a lot of you don't like that. I can just tell. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I'm trying to help you. You have to take your authority and resist the devil, and part of that resisting the devil is not giving place to him through sin, and through rebellion, and through these things. I've prayed with people before who were dying. I, I prayed with a person who had a tracheotomy because they had destroyed their lungs through smoking. And I could smell cigarettes on them. And I said, is this because of smoking? And they said, yes. Now, would that keep God from healing them? No. But I could smell cigarettes on them. And I said, are you still smoking? And they said, yes. And they were using, they were putting the cigarette up to this hole in their throat and smoking through the hole in their throat. And I said, why should I pray for you? I said, you're doing the same thing that caused this problem. Well, I just can't quit. I said, you quit? If I put a gun to your head and said, you smoke another cigarette and I'll kill you, you could quit. <laughs> you don't want to quit. You're enjoying it. You need to cooperate. Now, you can get to an extreme where there are some Christians who've gone so extreme that they eat twigs and berries and they won't eat meat and they do all this weird stuff. I tell people, I said, that's not food, that's what food eats. <laughs> Amen. I'm not going to get into all of this. I know some of you are thinking, well, the Bible says that you can't eat pork, you can't eat shellfish, you can't eat this. All of those things it says in Colossians 2.16, the only place in Scripture, 2.16 and 17, the only place in Scripture where the dietary laws were explained, it says that they were shadows of something that was to come. They were not given for health reasons. That might have been a secondary benefit to it, but they were given as shadows of a New Testament reality. And Jesus said, or excuse me, not, he said through um, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that if anybody preaches for you not to eat meats, to abstain from meats, it is a doctrine of the devil. Jesus ate fish in his glorified body. And a lot of what's being proclaimed in the name of the Lord, this, these health diets and eating certain ways and 
all of this stuff, it's demonic. And it's taken your faith away from trusting in Jesus and you're trusting in all of these things. And that's wrong. I knew a guy and his wife who got so conscious of being healthy that they went up into the mountains, the high Sierras of California, and they lived up there for years. And they ate nothing but twigs and berries. And when they finally came back into the city, their body was so clean that they could walk under a power line and their hair would stand up. <laughs> but did you know the whole time they were doing all of that, they were sick. They had allergies. They had all kinds of things wrong with them for years. They got born again and started blessing their food. And in a matter of a week, all of their allergies and everything were gone when they started blessing their food and praying over it and quit worrying about all this other stuff. There's a balance. Don't go out and eat at McDonald's every day. But I'm saying the scripture teaches things in moderation. And so I'm just trying to give some balance here. You could take what I'm saying and you could go to an extreme where if you do one slight thing and, and indulge yourself or do anything, then you think, well, I don't deserve to be healed. I'm, I'm giving place to the devil. That is extreme. That's a doctrine of the devil. Just do things in moderation. Amen. And you, but you do need to resist the devil, not only by yelling at him and saying, in the name of Jesus, leave me alone, but you need to act holy. You need to get out of strife. You need to quit living in sin. If you're shacking up with somebody, stop it. You're giving Satan a direct inroad into your life. If you're a homosexual, stop it. It's Satan a direct inroad into your life. If you're just doing all this stuff, stop it. Now, I know, see, this isn't near as popular as just having you come up here and let me wave my hand over you. <laughs> so that you can go back to being uh, whatever you were. But I'm telling you, if you want to be healed, this is how you do it. You can't cooperate with the devil and come out of it unscathed. That's not the way it works. I've known many people that just flirted with the devil in some area thinking, well, it's not really bad. You give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. It's like a fungus. It's like a disease. You, you allow that... to you and he's going to do what he can to destroy you and so as much as you can you need to resist the devil with your lifestyle but always depend upon the grace of God because none of us are perfect we will fail and when you do father thank you for forgiveness you repent of it and you can still be healed you can walk in healing but you can't do it just willingly rebelling at God and giving Satan a free shot at you that's not the way that it works and then the last thing I'd like to mention, uh, number five, and I need to quit, is you got to act on your faith. And there's a lot of people that are sitting here saying, oh, I believe it's God's will to heal. I've got authority and they'll speak in the name of Jesus. But then they act sick. This goes along with what I was saying earlier about you still talk sick. You confess that you're sick and stuff. But you've also got to act well. You know, Teresa, when she was giving her testimony, the Lord spoke to her about quitting the medicine. Now, there's a balance here. If you go out and quit your medicine because I said so, and you didn't believe, you could die or you could have some problem. I am not the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you when to quit your medicine, but I can tell you this. If you're taking medicine, it's because you still believe you're sick. You know why I don't take your medicine? Because I don't believe I'm sick. 
If you're taking it, it's because you believe you're sick. Now, if you really believe that by His stripes you're healed, by His stripes you're healed, then eventually, maybe not right away, maybe you have to taper off of it according to your faith. The Holy Spirit will tell you how to do it, but eventually you're going to have to act well. And this, this ties in with what I was saying about the authority issue. Satan gains authority through our actions. That's how he gains inroad into our life. And if you are acting wrong, it gives Satan an inroad. Your actions are one of the most important things that you can do. It's how you use authority. And so one of the things you need to do when you're fighting sickness is you need to act on your faith. James chapter 2 says faith without works is dead. And works here isn't talking about holiness earning it. It just means you've got to have corresponding actions. You've got to act like you are professing. There are people that say, oh, I'm healed. And yet they'll lay in bed and act sick. Now, if you can't get out of bed, I mean, you do what you can do. Smith Wigglesworth and many people, I was just reading a thing by uh, John G. Lake. And I tell you what, these people who we refer back to had some of the greatest healing ministries. You would hate them today. Because, man, they made people act on their faith. This was a big deal. But today, people, you know, we'll pray for you, and then you still act sick, talk sick, think sick, dream sick. You need to act. I remember one time, Jamie and I, when we were in our poverty days, and I was painting a house, and we had a payday coming. We really needed the money. I was up on the second story of this house painting and I got, I got to feeling sick and I came home for lunch and I hurt so bad I didn't want to eat. I just laid down and I said, I don't think I can go back and I wouldn't have been paid that day. Well, Jamie said, no, you are going back. We are getting paid. And so I had her pray for me, but because we understood these things, she says, you're acting well. And I said, just let me lay here during... And she says, no, get up. And so she had me put my arm around her neck and she drugged me through the house with her dancing and jumping and praising God. And at first she was dragging me and she says, you start acting like you're well. And you know what? I didn't feel like it, but I started acting like I was well. And in an hour, I was well. And I went back and finished the thing and got paid. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that you won't act like you're well. There's people who say, well, what would happen if I fall? Fall. <laughs> you're letting fear keep you from doing something. You need to act in faith. You know, the day that I got ordained to the ministry, it was New Year's Eve, and I was working around the house, and I went to raise up this garage door, and I was just going to grab it with one hand and raise it, and the thing bound and caught. And anyway, when I did that, I did something to my back. I don't know what it was, but my back, boy, just hurt, and my shoulder blades went back, and my shoulder blades were touching each other in the back. And I couldn't straighten up. And I fell on the ground. I was in such pain. And Joshua, my oldest son, was about a year old. And I couldn't talk. I could just barely whisper. And I said, Joshua, go get mommy. And he'd just go, mommy, mom. And I said, no, go get mommy. And anyway, I laid there for 30 minutes or whatever. And Jamie finally came out to see what was going on. And she saw me down there and what's wrong with you? And I said, I hurt my back. So she prayed for me. She said, get up and just yank me up. <laughs> and my shoulder back, blades were back like this and my back was hurting. And you know what I did? For eight hours, I did push-ups, sit-ups, I fought that thing, I did everything I didn't feel like doing. I was in excruciating pain, but I wasn't about to just lay there and do nothing. And finally, about 10 o'clock at night, I would have gone to bed normally at 10 o'clock, so I finally did go to bed and I fell asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I was laying there and I had no pain and I thought, praise God. And as soon as I stepped out of bed, boy, my shoulder blades went back and the pain was right back. 
And I went all of that day resisting that and doing things. And finally it came down to, was I going to go to the ordination service? Was I going to be ordained or not? Was I going to be standing there talking about, I'm a great man of faith and power? <laughs> and, uh, and I started to call and tell them I can't make it. And I thought, man, that's not faith. I'm healed. And so I started getting ready. And at that time, we didn't have a shower. I sat in a bathtub, and I had to bend over to wash my hair. And boy, that's when it hurt the worst was when I put my head down. And I started to ask Jamie to come in and wash my hair for me. And I said, I wouldn't have normally asked her to wash my hair. So I just put my head over and started washing my hair and praying in tongues. And somewhere between the first and the second rinse, I was totally healed, praise God. And you know, that has been over 40 years and I've never had another back problem and I can guarantee you I had a serious back problem and it you know without the Lord it would have manifested and I live things and I do things all of the time and I've never had another back problem it was a miracle but an important part of it was me resisting the devil in my actions faith without works is dead you need to act heal the best you can if you're paralyzed, wiggle your eyes, blink, do something. Smith Wigglesworth had a woman that he was praying for and she was in a nearly comatose state. And he says, you got to do something. Faith without works is dead. Do something. She was he was telling a person in a comatose state to do something. And finally they looked and she wiggled her little finger. Just It twitched. And he said, that's enough. So he prayed for her and she died. So he got her and drug her out of the bed and propped her in the corner and said, walk in the name of Jesus. And she fell on her face. So he got her and plunked, put her back up and said, walk. And she just fell and caught herself and walked out, raised from the dead, all because she wiggled her little finger. But you got to start doing something. You got to resist the devil. There's a balance to this. And if you go to doing this because you say, well, that's what Andrew did, and it's not a word from God, you can cause problems. There's people that have quit their insulin and have died, and then faith gets a bad name. The Bible did not say that works make faith come. And this is where some people have missed it. They thought if I'll just act healed when I really don't believe it, well, then healing will come. Faith will come. No, faith doesn't come by acting well. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. But once you have faith, you are going to have to eventually act on it. And if you're afraid to act on it, then it's not real faith. If, it's, if you aren't there in real faith, well, then be honest enough to admit that I'm not there yet. And praise God, I'm just going to keep building my faith and wait until, you know, like Teresa was saying, that moment when, you know, the last straw happens and you know now that God has told you. But eventually, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to quit acting sick, talking sick, pampering your sickness. You're going to have to resist it. I was out here running, not very far from here, and it was in the winter, and it was snow, and I went down a real steep hill. I mean, this hill was as tall as this ceiling, and it was a real steep hill, and I was going across it and sliding as I did, and anyway, I, as I was going down the hill, my foot got caught in a root that was out like this, a tree root, and it snapped, and it broke my ankle, I guess. I could hear the thing snap. Boy, it was painful, and I rolled all the way down that hill uh, to the bottom. And it was, I was eight miles from our house. It was at the time over here in Woodland Park. I was eight miles from home. In the winter, it was probably zero or close to zero, snow everywhere. And I'd have died if I'd have stayed out there. And so you know what I did? By the time I rolled to the bottom of that hill, I jumped straight up in the air and said, I'm healed in the name of Jesus and ran eight miles on a broken ankle and ran home. And when I got home, that thing was swelled up and hurting. And I believed I was healed. And the next morning I got up, it was totally normal and I've never had another problem. And some people think I'd never do that. That's the reason you're sick. You got to get to where you hate sickness and you realize you've got authority and power. God's done his part and you got to start fighting and resisting that thing. 
Jamie and I were talking just the other day about people that once they have something happen, many people just, oh, I, I'm hurt, and they go to pampering it, and that will lead to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But you find these people have, have an attitude, and people criticize them for it, but that's one of the things that makes them healthy. My mother lived to be 96 years old, and my sister was always on her case. You're 96. Quit doing this. Quit doing that. You need to take it easy. You could fall. You could hurt yourself. You could do something. And every time I'd get around, I said, Joyce, don't you realize that it's this independent attitude and the fact that my mother would not take these things that has kept her healthy all this time. She was healthy as a whore. Didn't take any medication until she was about 94. And I mean, one time she fell and caught herself on her hand and uh, she called me and asked me to take her to the emergency room. I said, I could pray with you. And she says, nope, I want to go to the emergency room. So I took her to the emergency room. They x-rayed and she had a thousand breaks in her hand. Her hand shattered. They said, you'll never use this hand again. And they put it in a cast. And she was working for me and she wrote down things and opened up all of our mail. And when she got back to home, she got to thinking about this and she said, I'm not going to accept this. And she soaked that cast in the bathtub and cut the cast off and went and got her a rubber ball and started exercising her hand and her right hand was better than her left hand the rest of her life. And some people think, I'd never do that. You'd have just accepted it. I'm telling you, you got to resist the devil. You got to fight. You got to act like you're well. Amen. But once you ever get this pathetic attitude, oh God, what's wrong? And you start feeling sorry for yourself, it's over. You know, Adam was talking tonight up here in the praise and worship, and he was saying, you got to get angry. There's a holy anger. The Bible says that to be angry and sin not, Ephesians 4.28. That isn't talking about that... Um, it goes on to say Ephesians 4.20, or is it 28 or 26? That's 26. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. People have thought that that's talking about God knows you're going to get mad, you're just human, so he gives you leeway, just make sure you get it confessed every night before you go to bed. That is not what that's talking about. This did not approve of anger during daylight and, and it outlawed it at night. This is talking about that there is a godly type of anger. Be angry and sin not. There is a righteous, godly anger. And don't ever let it go to bed. Keep yourself stirred up. Don't ever become passive, but stay angry. You need to hate sickness. You need to hate disease. You need to say, I'm not living this way. You need to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's resisting the devil. And then you act on your faith. And I tell you, that is a powerful force if your actions are the byproduct of faith, not something you're doing thinking that's going to make you have faith. You've got to get in the Word and let the Word produce faith. But anyway, these are just five real simple things. And again, every one of them, I could have taught on each one of these for hours. But uh, it's just simple stuff. And hopefully it'll give you an overview. I promise you, if you would meditate on those things and begin to start operating in some of these things I was talking about, it would make a world of difference in you receiving healing. We are way too passive, just thinking it's all up to God, and we come begging as if, God, I'm, I can't do anything. I'm just looking to you. No, you are the one that has power and authority. Amen? Amen. Cancer ought to be afraid of you. You're the one that has power and authority, and yet most of us are afraid of it because we don't know our authority and we don't act on it. But we, we're the ones that have that power and authority. Amen. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, we're going to pray for you. Hopefully, your faith has been stirred up, and some of you now are ready to act and do something and we're going to pray for you and we'll see people healed tonight. But I believe it's absolutely essential that we give you an opportunity tonight to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Jesus said, you receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And in Acts chapter 2, when they received the Holy Spirit, they spoke with tongues. 
And out of this many people, you know, whether you're watching at home, live, live streaming, if you're downstairs, wherever you are, you can receive the Holy Spirit tonight. God has already done His part. It's finished. And He has commanded the Holy Spirit to come. And it's available to anyone who will ask. It says in Luke 11, 13, If you be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? That's all you've got to do. He's already provided it. It's done. Will you ask? Will you receive? Some people think, well, I got the Holy Spirit when I was born again. I'm not going to debate that. It is true to a degree, but there is a second experience with the Holy Spirit where it is different. I got born again when I was eight years old, but when I was 18 is when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, it was life transforming. It totally, totally changed my life. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. Somebody says, I don't believe you have to speak in tongues. I don't believe you have to either. You get to speak in tongues. It is a part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can you have the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? Absolutely. I've got the Holy Spirit and I'm not speaking in tongues right now. I've got the Holy Spirit. It doesn't only come when I'm speaking in tongues. You cannot speak in tongues, but why would you want to do that? The Bible talks about its power. It's like flipping a switch and turning on the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know some people are taught that, man, that stuff doesn't work for us today. Well, I'm telling you, I'm a tongue talker. How many people in here speak in tongues? So whether you know it or not, you are in one of those meetings. They are going to talk about you. You may have come here not realizing that I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit because I'm not like your typical Pentecostal on television that spits and wipes my fevered brow and says glory to God. But I am baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so they're going to talk about you. You might as well get something. Amen. You need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. I promise you it's important. Jesus said you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. It will transform the way you do things. It'll not any longer be just you, but it'll be God's power living on the inside of you. Is there anybody in here tonight who would raise your hand and say, man, I don't have that, but I want to receive it. If you don't speak in tongues and you want to receive it, I want you to raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Man, this is great. Hallelujah. You know, if you're downstairs, we've got people downstairs, they'll minister to you, or you could come up here. But if you raised your hand, or if you were supposed to raise your hand and didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward and stand right here? And we want to pray with you and help you to receive. Praise God. Come forward right now and let us pray with you. Just face me. Praise the Lord. Man, this is great. This is going to make a difference in your life. I believe you'll never be the same again. God bless you. Hallelujah. I don't know how you all made it so long without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I tell you what, that just changed my life. It changed me when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you need to leave, please leave as quietly as you can so that the, everybody will be paying attention here and receiving because this is important. This is going to make a big difference in your life. Amen. Isn't this awesome? Yes. Hallelujah. Before I can pray with you, well, we still got people coming, so scoot in a little bit. You can also spread out on the sides. We got some room on the sides. But I want to get everybody down here where I can see you eyeball to eyeball. Before I can pray with you to receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of speaking in tongues, the scripture says Jesus is the one who fills you with the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. If you don't know Jesus personally, you need to be born again. And there's a lot of people who think, well, I, I suspect I do. I mean, I guess I do. I believe that God exists. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe that there's one God, 
You do well, the devils also believe and tremble. But won't you know, a vain man, that faith without works is dead. That's one of the most sarcastic statements in the whole Bible. Just because you believe that there's a God doesn't mean you've done anything the devil hadn't done. You got to do more than believe he exists. It's all about making him your Lord. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You have to make Jesus your Lord. You have to not only acknowledge that He exists, but you have to submit your life to Him. You have to commit your life and turn it over to Him. This doesn't mean you'll do it perfectly. You can't live perfectly, but you have to be willing to make Him the Lord of your life. And He'll work on you, and He'll be patient with you, and you'll grow and increase in this, but you do have to make Him your Lord. If you've never done that, if all you've done is just acknowledge that God exists, or if you're depending upon your own goodness instead of a Savior, you need to make Jesus your personal Lord. And so before you can receive the Holy Spirit, you've got to first of all receive Jesus. Is there anybody who would raise your hand and say, I think I need to pray that prayer first? Anybody else? Here's some right here. Praise God. Anybody else? You know, if you aren't sure and you're saying, well, I hope I've done that. The Bible says that when you get born again, you know you have passed from death unto life. You have a witness in yourself. If you don't know, if you're just wishing and hoping and, and supposing that you're okay, you ought to pray this prayer and make sure. Anybody else here want to raise your hand and just make sure? Here's another one back here. Here's a bunch more. You need to be sure. You need to know. Amen. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'd like you to repeat this prayer after me. I'd like to ask everybody in here to pray so that they wouldn't feel like we're just listening to them. And this isn't magic. You have to believe it. But if you will say what I'm saying, this you don't have to say these exact words, but something similar to this. And if you will repeat it and mean it in your heart, then you'll be born again based on what the Word of God says. Isn't that awesome? Jesus has already forgiven your sins. It's not a matter of will He forgive you. It's a matter of will you make Him your Lord. That's the only question. And if you will mean this from your heart, you will be saved. So let's say this. Say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus has already forgiven my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Do you mean that? Awesome. Praise God. Well, welcome to the family. You know what? On the outside, you're still a man or a woman. You're still short or tall. Your mind still has the same memories. But in your spirit, the Bible says you're a brand new person. You are totally changed in your spirit. You no longer have the nature of the devil on the inside of you. You have God living on the inside. And the Bible says twice in 1 Corinthians that you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is really important because we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill you. And you got to remember, this is what you were created for. You are a temple, a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So the Lord would not reject a single one of you from receiving the Holy Spirit. This is what you were created for. He wants this more than you want it. So you don't have to wonder, will he do it? He promised if you ask, he'll give. And all you got to do is just in a sense open up the doors of your temple and say, I welcome you. He won't force himself. He's a gentleman. You have to desire this power from God. But we're going to just simple. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. We're going to open up the doors of our heart and welcome the Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to release this power of the Holy Spirit with my words. You can release power through words. And so I'm going to release the power of the Holy Spirit. At that time, I want you to believe that the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you. And then after I do that, after we pray, I want you to lift your hands and start thanking Him that He gave you the Holy Spirit. I don't care what you feel like. 
Some people teach that you have this overwhelming emotional experience, and sometimes people do. But when I received the Holy Spirit, I didn't feel a thing. I had to do it totally based on faith. I stuck my finger on that scripture, Luke 11, 13, and said, I asked and I believe I receive, and I didn't feel a thing, and I just did it by faith. So whether you feel anything or not, God promised He would give you the Holy Spirit. So after I lead you in prayer, I want you to put your hands in the air like this, because when you raise your hands, the Bible says this blesses God. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. That's what we call this whole property. And bless the Lord. This blesses God. It's like when somebody sticks a gun in your back and you go, I surrender. Amen. So I'm going to pray for you and then I want you to lift your hands and start thanking Him that you have the Holy Spirit just like He promised He would do. And then those of us who know how to pray in tongues, we're going to start praying in tongues. And as we pray in tongues, I want you to join in with us and just start thanking Him in tongues. The Bible says when you pray in tongues, you're giving thanks. So you're praising Him in a heavenly language. It's bypassing your brain. It's coming out of your spirit. It doesn't have the confusion and the fear. And anyway, it's powerful. I've got a lot I could share. I've got a book I'm going to give every one of you that will explain it. But if you're ready, you can pray in tongues right now. The last instruction I'll give you is some people wait on the Holy Spirit to force you to speak in tongues. They think that it's going to just come up and you can't control it. Kind of like when you throw up, you can't stop it. It just comes out. That is not how it works. Acts chapter 2 verse 4 says, They spoke with tongues. Talking about the apostles spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the inspiration. The Holy Spirit inspires speaking in tongues, but He doesn't speak in tongues. You have to speak. It's you talking. It's like when I spoke tonight. If I would have said, Oh God, speak through me. Don't let it be me. Please speak through me. And then if I just opened my mouth and waited on God to make me talk, you still wouldn't have heard a word. He didn't force me to talk. I spoke. That's the reason it came out in Texan. That's the reason it came out in my personality. But I believe it was inspired of God. It was God speaking through me, but it was me speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's the way speaking in tongues is. You have to speak. If you don't open your mouth, you won't speak in tongues. If you don't make a sound, you won't speak in tongues. You've got to speak and by faith believe that God is inspiring it. And at first you may think, well, this is just me. It is you, but it's not just you. And it'll take time. God will confirm to you and you'll begin to start seeing so much benefit of this that it will, He will confirm it to you that it's Him. But you're going to have to take a step of faith and speak. That's one of the reasons that the gift of speaking in tongues is so powerful because you have to push into faith to speak in tongues. It will sound stupid to your mind because you won't know what you're saying. So everybody understand that? Yes. You going to pray in tongues? Yes. The Bible says believers will speak with new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And I will speak in tongues. <laughs> Father, I thank you for all of these. And right now, I just praise you for those who prayed to make Jesus their Lord and Savior, and we believe, according to the Word of God, that they are a brand new person on the inside, that their sins are gone, and that they are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So everyone down here, Father, we are your temple. We want your Holy Spirit to come and reside in us and give us power like Jesus promised. And we want, Father, this gift of speaking in tongues. So we just simply ask, open up the doors of our heart, and say, Holy Spirit, come. Fill us with your power. We want your gifts flowing in us. And we receive. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I loose this anointing of the Holy Spirit to come through every single person here. Holy Spirit, come. Dwell in us. Fill us. Live in us right now. We trust your promise that you do it. And we thank you. Right now we lift our hands and start thanking you that you have filled us with the Holy Spirit. We are God-possessed. We are now filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and we do have the gift of speaking in tongues. Thank you, Jesus. So those of you who know how to pray in tongues, let's just begin to worship the Lord right now. Speak in tongues. And as we speak in tongues, join in with us. 
tinkero sombriendi, ikalarombo, koros shintale, inderi di kisti, adembero sombrat katta. Just speak. You can't talk in tongues with your mouth closed. You gotta open your mouth and talk. Keep up a singolo oro sandi di di kitala mario sonombaka. Danini na mario ro cobra site, evitara mokoro sotonomba. You can't speak in tongues in English at the same time. So you're going to have to start making sounds that you don't know what they are. When a child first speaks, it doesn't sound like they're saying daddy, but that daddy knows what they're saying. You may think yours doesn't sound like a very good tongue, but your heavenly father is hearing your heart. He's inhabiting your praises right now. You're bypassing your doubt and unbelief and you're praying out of your spirit, man. You're communicating with God in a language that doesn't have the limitations of your natural language. And this is powerful. Powerful. Praise God. Just keep speaking. Man, many, many people here, you can tell by the look on their face. And man, they believe that this is God inspiring them. They are speaking in tongues. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah! Man, that's powerful. Praise God. Let me have your attention here for just a moment. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you know, whether you spoke in tongues or not, I believe God gave you the Holy Spirit because He promised that He would. When I first prayed to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, I didn't speak in tongues immediately. It took me three and a half years before I spoke in tongues, but that's because I was a Baptist. And I had been taught that this was of the devil, and I had so much fear and worry. But I kept at it, and I finally got my questions answered, and now I speak in tongues a lot. And I tell you, it is a powerful experience. So whether you spoke in tongues or not, God gave it to you, but you may have to get some of your questions answered. And I've written a book about this. The first part of this book defines what a true believer is. Those of you who prayed to make Jesus your Lord tonight, it will explain to you what just happened. And it will give you a list of teachings that you need to get started to understand what's going on. And the second half of the book is all about speaking in tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It will answer your questions. And I've literally had thousands of people receive the gift of speaking in tongues after reading this book. So I want to give every one of you a copy of this book. It's free of charge. And we've got people over here. They're going to take you, I'm not sure where, but through that door, maybe out into the hall. And they'll give you this book. And if you have any questions, they'll answer your questions too. But I really want you to get the maximum benefit. What's happened to you tonight is bigger than what any of you understand. I don't care if you felt something. It's more than what you felt. You've got to understand it to release the full potential of it. And so this... The truths that are in this book are absolutely essential. I encourage you to read it. And praise God, I believe you're going to be stronger than horseradish from this time on. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Go right out here. And they've got the books out here. It's a free gift. And we'll give this book to all of you. And I promise you it's going to be a blessing. So it'll just take a few moments if you go out there. We want you to get that book. Amen. Praise the Lord. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to have people come up here for prayer. I'm not through, so let me... If you need prayer for anything, I'd like to ask our prayer ministers to come down here so that they can pray with you. You need prayer? we got people that are going to pray with you here tonight. If you'll go with David, he'll help you right here to receive prayer. Let's have our prayer ministers come and stand down here at the front. Let me go ahead and give this invitation, okay? Praise the Lord. These are people that have been through our training here at our healing school, and they've been seeing awesome, awesome miracles happen. So if you need prayer, I know we've seen so many healings today, but I believe that faith comes by hearing. I know that people's faith was quickened tonight. 
by the teaching. And if you need prayer for anything, I want you to come and let one of these people here. They have these lanyards on, and they are here to pray with you. And so uh, come down and let one of our prayer ministers pray with you. The rest of you, remember that we start at 8 o'clock with a continental breakfast. 8.30 is our praise and worship. 9 o'clock we actually start our session. And I tell you, praise and worship is powerful. Don't miss it. Plus, you need to get here early so you can get a place. If you need prayer, come right now and let someone pray with you. Praise the Lord. Hey, Daniel. So praise God. If you need prayer, come and let someone pray with you. The rest of you, thank you for coming. We'll see you in the morning. It's been an awesome, awesome day. God bless you. Yeah, can we just tell Andrew thank you tonight for such a powerful time of ministry. Praise the Lord. We've got prayer ministers all across the front tonight. And we are just blessed uh, to be able to be here ministering to you. And we're going to be here just as long as we need to. So uh, thank you for having your expectation turned on tonight. And we're going to believe God for great things. Amen.